Welcome to Look Up with Pastor Mike and his wife, Linda Sasso of Calvary Chapel of Eagle, a radio ministry designed to assist you in applying God's Word to your everyday life. For the next hour, Pastor Mike and Linda will encourage you with your walk with Christ and help you look up to Jesus. If you need advice on marriage, life challenges, or relationships, call in now. It's time to look up to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Here's Mike and Linda. Well, hi, everybody. It's Easter week. We're getting ready for our Good Friday service uh, on Friday, as well as uh, Easter Sunday, actually appropriately called Resurrection Sunday. And I hope that everyone listening to the sound of my voice, you have a good church to attend, that you will be going to uh, the sunrise services. I used to call it sunrise because all the years I've <laughs> spent, well, you know, all the years in Southern California, we'd have sunrise service. We'd, we'd go down there before the sun came up and we'd have outside stadium. Uh, that's a little risky doing that here in Idaho. Anyway, listen. It rains on Easter here a lot of times. It's true. It's yeah. true. And sometimes that's way too cold to expect people to be outside. Of course, Unless it's a football game, then they'll be outside. Listen, it is Thursday, April 18th, 2019. In case you're wondering if this is a rebroadcast, uh, I want you to know that so that you know if it's safe to call in or write in. Sometimes people will call in when we're gone or they'll text us and we're not in the studio. So we are in the studio today, Thursday, April 18th, 2019, and we'd love to hear from you. We actually take great joy when we get calls and of course we we quite often do get texts whether it's through Facebook live or through um, the church phone because we know a lot of the the folks in our fellowship and then just friends of ours who know us from outside of the church uh, will listen and make comment and participate listen just to get that all clear I'm gonna let Linda clarify with you and tell you all the different ways you could interact with us today and here she is Hello, folks. Hey, we would love to hear from you, so give us a call. Come on, be brave, be on the radio with us. That number is 208-377-3790. Again, that's 208-377-3790. If that talking live on the radio thing just really disturbs you, You can send a text message to Calvary Chapel Eagle's phone, and that is 208-891-2635. If you're out there in Facebook Live land, you can go ahead and leave a comment. We will answer when it's appropriate. And I do want to invite you to our Good Friday service. It is 630 North Star Charter School. Um, We're going to be going going through a really neat presentation um, that night. And it won't be long, and it's a family service. Bring the whole family. And Easter Sunday is 10 a.m. at North Star Charter School. We invite you to join us. Okay, well, just I think I explained to you guys yesterday uh, what we're doing for Good Friday service. And there's a lot of great churches doing Easter services, whether it's Good Friday or Easter Sunrise. Uh, or <laughs> Easter <laughs> Resurrection Easter Sunday is what I keep meaning to say. Uh, but listen... Uh, what we're doing, and I, if you, in case you missed it yesterday, we're actually taking the Merged Gospels by Gary Crossland, who uh, advertises on this station, and uh, we're going to listen to a section of the audio together, put together with a slideshow, just reminding us and taking us through the journey of Jesus through the trial bet- before Pilate, before Herod, the Jewish leaders, uh, and the uh, the all the way up to the crucifixion and the burial of Christ. And I, I just because I was re- reviewing it today, making sure I've got it right because I'll be running the slideshow since I put the slide presentation together. And the, the presentation takes about 25 minutes, but what we're going to do is we're going to show a section of it, stop and do some worship that fits appropriately into that section, watch another section, stop and worship the Lord some more, uh, a couple songs that stop and, and so and so. We'll, we'll and so the whole service will probably be <laughs> forty five minutes to an hour. Uh, but we're going to focus in on the the crucifixion and just the, all that took place to with you know to Jesus on Good Friday, and uh, we will also have communion on Friday. So if you join us for that, we'll just have a time of meditating on the cross and all that that means, and then take communion, which is quite appropriate. Because communion reminds us of the price that Jesus paid for us. All right, we are in a a series right now uh, for Easter week. 
we're looking at all of the se- the seven sayings of Christ on the cross, and we are on saying four, but let me just remind you what the first three were. Uh, the first one, and this is in chron- chronological order, what Jesus said on the cross is one of the first things he said was in Luke twenty three thirty four. He said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And that was actually uh, the, the theme of that, and we talked quite in depth about it, is just forgiveness. Isn't that wonderful? Because that's what Christianity is all about, forgiveness of sin. It, Jesus came to deal with our sin in particular. The second saying uh, on the cross was in Luke chapter 23, verse 43, and that's Jesus speaking to the thief on the cross next to him who had a deathbed conversion, who, uh, while he was dying, realized that Jesus was actually the Messiah, put his faith in Christ, says, remember me when you come into my kingdom. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. And the theme of that is hope. You just really see that it's never too late to come to Christ. And some people get upset about that idea. They think, hey, that thief on a cross shouldn't go to heaven, or that person who lived their evil life, and then they, they, they had a deathbed conversion. Well, that, how fair is that? Well, guess what? It's not fair. And if we get what's fair, we'll all go to hell, okay? So thank God we don't get what's fair because we'd all be in trouble. We get grace. If you get anything uh, from God, it's the amazing grace through Christ. Okay, so that was the second saying, today you'll be with me in paradise. The third saying, which we left off on yesterday, was when uh, Jesus looked down from the cross, saw his beloved apostle John and his mother standing next to him, He says, woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And uh, the the apostle John actually took uh, Mother Mary into his household from that day forth. And we talked a lot about, you know, spiritual family being as important and sometimes even more important than physical uh, family because Jesus did have other brothers and sisters. Contrary to popular belief, Jesus did have other brothers and sisters After he was born, you know, he was the oldest, but after he was born, there were other, Mary had other children. Some people don't, don't want to accept that, you know, because they love the, the theme of the perpetual virginity of Mary. Uh, okay, I'm going to get off for a second here. If that were true, my friend, especially my Catholic friends who are listening, then Mary would have been a disobedient wife and not a very good wife if she's going to be married to a man and, and, stay a perpetual virgin. Uh, that's not God's plan for marriage. That's not a good thing to do your husband. <laughs> and uh, Mother Mary wouldn't be so praised. Uh, I don't know why religion has to take things and mess it up so much, and then they'll worship Mother Mary, the perpetual virgin, when in reality she was a blessed among women. She bore Jesus, praise the Lord, uh, but she was not exalted to the queen of heaven mother of God and all the stuff people run off with, perpetual virgin. Anyway, we didn't talk about that yesterday, but I'll just squeeze that in there for extra credit, okay? (laughs) Because it is one of my pet peeves. I was, many of you may know, I was raised a Catholic, and I learned a lot of good things uh, in my childhood, and probably the greatest thing was just reverence and respect for God, but I did learn a lot of false doctrine along the way, things that I had to correct once I started reading my Bible. And I would recommend and encourage every single one of you out there, whatever you are a part of, if people are saying, well, you're in a cult, or that's a false religion, or that's not a good church, you know what, how you fix all that stuff? Just start reading your Bible, okay? Uh, read your Bible and take it for what it says. And and it's self-correcting, I would say, uh, the spiritual Christian is self-correcting because as you seek the Lord and as you read the Word of God, no matter what your church is, and we all, you know, probably every one of us have things in our church doctrine that might be a little off or need some correction, believe it or not. I mean, some of you think, well, my church is the church that, that got it right. All the other churches got it wrong. My church, we've got all of our doctrine right, and that church is full of false doctrine. And that's one of the problems with the church today is that critical spirit and that judgmental attitude that we look at other Christians and we think, well, they don't have it all together like I do. Well, guess what? You don't have it all together, and your church probably doesn't have it all together. And, you know, I've heard somebody recently tell me that I used to think, Churches are just too, so awesome, and then I went on staff at a church. <laughs> when you go on the inside and you oh, work at any yeah. organization that you think, oh, holy, holy, it's like being in heaven, and then you get hired on, just wait. You'll find out it's made with 
people and imperfect people. And even whether you're reformed or whether whatever, you know, the people get arrogant about uh, the, the Westminster Catechism and all these different catechisms you stick to. You know what? I believe that the Reformation was one of the best things that could happen to the Catholic Church back in that day. But we need constant reforming. We need constant correction. Uh, the reformers got a lot of things wrong. They still had a lot of false doctrine from Catholicism, and, and some of them even, they let the pendulum swing too far the other way with false, you know, extremes. We are all in this self-correction mode, folks, okay? It's funny, I'm talking about things I didn't plan on talking about, but there's things on my heart that I want to express to you all that n nobody's arrived yet. You are not perfect. I am not perfect. Your church is not the perfect church, my church is definitely not the perfect church. I'm not perfect, <laughs> definitely. And we're all <laughs> seeking to grow and move forward. Uh, the only thing I would urge you is to keep moving forward, not backward. Keep going upward, not downward. And, and so we learn from these things, and we will, as we read our Bible, we're going to find things, especially maybe you've read it three times, and now in the third time you're going, wait a second, I never caught this before. Let the Lord, by his Holy Spirit and by his word, correct you. Because we are all in this together, and you're going to be surprised when we get to heaven. You're going to probably be surprised who's there with you. And uh, you might even be surprised who's not there, okay? You just worry about you and study the word of God and keep moving forward, and we'll just keep growing in grace. We had a text come in say, I am perfectly imperfect. Wow, <laughs> what a perfectly imperfect statement. That's great. <laughs> okay, well, uh, so we're moving through the sayings of Christ on the cross. I just covered the first three in review. And uh, now we're going to move to number four, which <coughs> we just mentioned just before we went off the air yesterday. And it was when Jesus was on the cross and he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And it's actually. Oh, you said that nicely. Yeah, well, I've practiced. No, actually, I've said, I've heard it enough times, you know. And uh, actually, a little secret: uh, when you when you're not sure about how to pronounce a word and you have to say it, uh, put little hy hyphens where the syllables divide. That's what I do, and it helps me realize that's where the that's how the word is broken up. <laughs> I do that. And my, if you ever get my notes, take a look at my notes when I'm teaching. If I'm gonna pronounce a difficult word I actually put little lines to break up the word in syllables so I'll look at it and make sure I pronounce the syllables properly because it's so easy some of those Bible words that we never say you know I hardly well, I don't, different languages honey. yeah yeah well I don't know remember last time I said sabachthani you know that's that's a tough one uh, anyway Eloi, Eloi. anyway <laughs> And that's found in Matthew chapter 27, uh, verse 46, as well as Mark 15, 34. We began to look at this yesterday, and uh, I think I, I do also have notes from the Fire Study Bible. I don't believe I, I began to read those notes yet. Uh, but but let me just lay this the scene out, and then we're going to read some notes. I, if you've listened to this program long enough, you've heard me, whether in our church or on the radio, you realize I like to keep things simple. And I like to keep the cookie on the bottom shelf, uh, for one thing, because I'm not so tall. I can only reach the bottom shelf. And, and it's important mm -hmm. to make things and explain things so that the average person could understand it, not to impress people with big words so that you could, uh, you know, dazzle folks. We just want to make sure we get this, okay? Uh, and so one of the ways I do that is I, I've collected study Bibles, which have just a, a sentence or a paragraph or just a short explanation through your verse-by-verse -verse Bible, and I could look when I'm confused about something, or I'm trying to make sure I got a, a doctrine right, I'll look at several different study Bibles that will just give a brief explanation. I don't want to read a whole book explanation. Um, you'll lose me. You know, uh, matter of fact, I read too much. It makes me tired. I want to go to sleep. I'll take a nap. Uh, but if you, you collect a couple good study Bibles, I recommend the uh, NIV study Bible, the New... Uh, King James Study Bible, the New Living Translation Study Bible. Those are all three good ones. And today I will be uh, quoting from the Fire Study Bible, which is a, a le less known study Bible, but it's got a lot of great articles, and, and I've used it a lot. Anyway, um, <clears throat> what I want to say before I read from this is that in when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you've got to feel what this is. Here's Jesus 
the Holy Son of God, God the Son, Son of God, who has been with God from eternity past. Read John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And he, he was actually part of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You just got to get the grasp, grasp the wholeness of who Jesus was. And for the first and only time in all of history, in all of eternity, thank God it's never going to happen again, Jesus experienced separation from his Father. And uh, in his crying out, he was feeling in his humanity. By the way, Jesus was 100% God, but he was 100% man. And this is another mystery that's hard to understand, but the doc, the Bible teaches it. It's doctrinally correct. Uh, so we know it's true because the Bible says, clearly states this. He was man. He was God. You know, that, that's another thing. I... I I have decided, I've come to the conclusion that I don't have to understand something to believe it. I just have to see that it is true. I can see the Bible teaches things that are true that are way beyond my understanding. I, I, I was talking yesterday, I think it was about astronomy and, you know, all the, they look through the telescopes and all the things they describe and the black holes and there's a lot of things I don't understand. I'm, I, I have a pea brain, you know, but I, it doesn't, it doesn't require my understanding it for it to be true, and it doesn't require my understanding it for me to believe it. And so I just want to encourage you to do the same thing, my friend, that you would just accept the truths of the Bible. If it's clearly taught in the Bible, embrace and accept it and believe it, okay? Uh, there's lots of things that will be in the Bible that you, how could that be? You know what? If you understood it, you'd be God. You don't understand these things. But here, Jesus is is separated Spiritually, he's the, he's lost connection with the Father to the point, and, and, and actually, this was the most painful thing. You think the crucifixion was painful? It was. You think the whipping and the beating and the pulling out of his beard was painful? It was. You think the crown on Jesus' head was painful? It was. But none of that was as painful as what he knew was coming when he prayed in the garden and sweat great drops of blood, and says, Oh God, if there's any way, Father, to take this cup from me, just remove it from me. And what was it? What was so painful? Two things. One is that this holy, pure, and sinless Son of God was going to bear the sins of the world. The guilt and shame that you and I deserve was placed upon Jesus Christ, the Holy One. And, and that was more painful to Jesus than any beating, any whipping, any tearing open of his back, any nailing, uh, nails through his hands, his wrist and his, his feet. All the things that you think were so terrible, they were terrible. But not near as terrible as the Holy One of Israel, the Holy Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, having to take on the shame and guilt of the sins of the world for, on our behalf. And I said two things. That's one. Two is because he took on that shame and that guilt of the sin. He was separated from the Father. Though for a brief time, he was separated from experiencing that sweet fellowship he's had from eternity past. He didn't have that fellowship with the Father. So, obviously, with that in mind, he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, another interesting thing about this it was predicted, I'm, on Easter Sunday, I'm going to talk about some of these things being prophesied, and that even the cross and the resurrection are fulfillments of prophecies of the Old Testament. If you read Psalm 22, it tells the whole story of the cross. And so, even even the, the um, I think Psalm 22 starts out with, my God, my God, why have you, somewhere in there, oh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It, it tells the story of Christ on the cross. I've even heard one of my pastors uh, years ago said that th he had a theory that Jesus was quoting Psalm 22 while he hung on the cross. I'm not quite sure he was actually quoting Psalm 22 word for word, but he definitely was fulfilling the prophetic words of Psalm 22 because in that psalm it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so, Great picture, deep, meaningful, rich, painful, realizing the agony Jesus was going through was not just agony, physical agony. It was spiritual agony. It was mental agony, which, by the way, if you've suffered in life long enough on, on various levels, you realize mental and spiritual pain is much, much worse than physical pain. I've had it all. No, and I've had it. I haven't had everything I possibly can have, thank God. But I'm telling you, <clears throat> uh, if I had a choice from suffering physically or suffering, suffering uh, emotionally, I'd rather suffer. 
oh man, I have a speech impediment. I'd rather suffer physically because it's just a mental and spiritual suffering can be so unbearable, so crippling. So that's what Jesus went through on the cross for you. Now, let me read that excerpt I told you about from the Fire Study Bible about why have you forsaken me. And he says, the ninth stage of Christ's suffering was perhaps the worst and most fearful. Uh, see Matthew twenty six thirty nine. What does that say? Oh, he just quotes it there. Uh, you got something, hon? You took a deep breath in like you were going to say something. Oh, I was going to read it for you. Okay. You it. uh, it's actually, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is there more to it? Um, no. Okay, I was in the wrong place. Oh, no. Now phones are going off. Okay. <laughs> turn, the, turn the camera off. Okay. I get it. <laughs> okay, here we go. It's not only involved physical torture, but also spiritual anguish of an unimaginable sense of separation from God, which is the ultimate consequence of sin. These words mark the climax of Christ's suffering for a spiritually lost world. His cry in Aramaic, there it is, it's Aramaic when he says, Eli, Eli, okay, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, indicates that Christ experienced the separation from God that was in store for all people as a result of sin. Are you, are you tracking with me here? Do you see why I like uh, some of the insights of the Fire Study Bible? Uh, when they do an article, they do a thorough outline, an article, and there just seems to be some richness. It's not just facts. A lot of our study Bibles or commentaries will give you historical facts, Greek or Hebrew. They'll give you information. But this is so true that uh, that separation from God was in store for all people as a result of sin. And, you know, folks, I think I've told you before, Either you're going to accept Christ died for you and, and he was separated from God and, and took on your guilt and shame and you're going to embrace that and, and accept him as your Lord and Savior or you're going to have to have that separation from God. You will end up experiencing uh, that that cold, hard separation. you got a choice. Someone's got to pay for sin. Either Christ pays for your sin or you pay for your sin. Okay, let's keep reading. It says, uh, this sense of separation was an intense, was intensified because Christ, as our substitute, actually took upon himself the full weight of guilt and punishment for every sin that has ever been committed or ever will be committed. Uh, see 2 Corinthians 5.21. We'll look at that in a moment. Oh, we know that yeah. scripture. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. I, I actually reminded myself later. Let, let's do talk about that. Uh, we cannot even begin to comprehend the sense of abandonment that Jesus felt as he hung on the cross. Here we see God's Son, the creator of the universe, and he quotes John 1, 1 through 3 that I was talking about earlier, not only rejected by his creation, but also isolated from the one who is everywhere. Now there's an interesting way of putting it. Mm. What would it feel like to be isolated from the one who is everywhere? And that kind of makes you nowhere. That's a pretty intense thought. Uh, no human ever endured such strong sense of judgment and I isolation from God. Um, pretty intense thought. Okay, and so as we approach Good Friday, we really want to grasp and, and appreciate what Jesus did on the cross for us, understand to the best of our ability the full extent of, of what he did for us and, and what he suffered for us. And you know what? To be honest with you, I, I said to the best of our ability because... We may never understand. We may never in all of eternity really fully get it, just how much he suffered for us. Uh, we get, just get glimpses and pictures of it. We try to make movies of it, but it falls short. We tr people have written books about it. but the, you know, And you, you can kind of get glimpses and pictures of all that Christ has done for us and his great love for us and so on and so forth. But, you know, folks, uh, our human minds can't comprehend it all. Anyway, the... Um, the study Bible, the fire study Bible goes on to say, even though he had, he had never sinned, God made him to be sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5.21. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. That's uh, Isaiah 53. He gave his life a ransom for many. Uh, he gave these two great uh, cross references, Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Jesus himself says that the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. That's Matthew twenty twenty eight. He, You know what, by the way, all that took place before he died, he had warned his apostles. He had given them a preview. 
He had said things like this, Matthew twenty twenty eight, that that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a, a ransom for many. So uh, Jesus even predicted his crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection, uh, and, and, and Easter Sunday. We're going to talk about all that. But uh, nothing should have been a surprise to the apostles other than maybe they just didn't believe it when he said it. I don't know. Have you ever heard somebody say something and you go, nah, it's not going to be that bad. It's going to be okay, you know. Anyway, uh, another one is First Timothy 2.6, uh, that speaking of Jesus, saying that he gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So those are the two cross-references that the Fire Study Bible gives for this article. Uh, going on. He died forsaken so that we would never have to be forsaken. Boy, there, there's a bumper sticker. Mm, yeah. You know, he died forsaken that we wouldn't never have to be forsaken. And then uh, again, it's quoting Psalm 22. I'd recommend sometime, maybe leading up to Good Friday, if you're looking for some good devotional time with your family, uh, open up Psalm 22 and read it together as a family. Open up Isaiah 53, read it together, maybe in several different translations with your family. Because these are, these are all prophetic, what we call a messianic prophecy or messianic psalm in, in Psalm 22, pointing to the coming of the Messiah. It goes on to say that by his suffering, he restored to those who trust him a right relationship with God. I like that. I like the way it's worded. Who gets restored? Those who trust him. Uh, there's a lot of people who make a lot of arguments of who gets in and who doesn't get in. Uh, but uh, the Fire Study Bible says that he restored to those who trust him a right relationship with God. And then it quotes First Peter one eighteen. Let me just look up what that says. First Peter one eighteen says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by traditions from your father, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish, without spot. I think verse 18 and 19 are, are almost contrast of First Peter 1. He says, you know, some people think that you're redeemed because of your family background, you know, the, the traditions, the re, your religious background, your religious traditions. And he says, you know, none of that matters, folks. Uh, Peter says, you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish, without spot. <clears throat> and if you know anything about the Old Testament sacrificial system, that that was the the system that God had enacted uh, that was to picture the Christ who is to come, that we are to have a blood without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness, no remission of sin, and that a lamb would be sacrificed on the Passover every year for the sins of the people. And it, that lamb had to have some very specific qualifications. It had to be without spot, without blemish, and had to fulfill all the requirements of the law. And Jesus did that for you. He kept the law perfectly. He was without sin. He was without spot, without blemish. And Jesus died for us as the Lamb of God <clears throat> that takes away the sins of the world. By the way, um, if you missed it, I don't know if it's been posted yet, um, for Palm Sunday, last Sunday, we actually went over the, the prophecies of of Daniel, uh, the seventy weeks of Daniel, Daniel chapter nine. I, I put up charts. We went through a lot of a lot of work to make sure we get this clear for everyone. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I talked about Jesus being the Lamb of God, perfect, sinless, spotless. But another qualification that only Jesus fulfilled, and it's the time is it's too late for anyone else to fulfillment to fulfill it, is that Jesus appeared on the exact day that the prophecies of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 predicted the exact day the Messiah would come the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world and it was Palm Sunday so it's done it's done deal folks if you're looking for a savior from the Old Testament prophecies it's already too late for anyone the day came and went it was Jesus Christ on Palm Sunday folks we'll be right back after this station identification and such and, and so we'll just hold on 60 seconds You're we'll be back to 94.1 The Voice KBXL Caldwell Boise radio you can believe in stay tuned we'll be right back look up airs every Monday through Friday afternoon from 2.30 to 3.30 through Facebook live text and phone you can ask questions on what the Bible has to say about the real things that are going on in your life. 
If you'd like to text the Sassos, the number is 208-891-2635. The best way to have your question answered is to call the Sassos in the studio right now. That number is 208-377-3790. To learn more about Calvary Chapel Eagle, visit calvarychapeleagle.com. Now, here's Mike and Linda. All right, for those of you out in Facebook Live land, you realize that <coughs> Linda goes nuts when I put the camera on her and she's going, take it off of me, take it off of me, and I just leave it on her just for fun. Uh, but listen, one of the things I wanted to talk about, um, one of the cross-references that we kept alluding to uh, that I says we'll talk about later, maybe it's time to talk about it now, it's Second Corinthians 5.21. And I prefer to read it at uh, this time in the NIV translation. I just, you know, I've looked at it a lot of different translations. I like the way the NIV, and you know, NIV stands for the nearly indispensable version. Uh, and so it's, um, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, we've talked a lot about John 3.16. We've talked about what Jesus did on the cross for us. But I love 2 Corinthians 5.21. It's actually the verse that uh, you may not know, but we've already put our tombstone up. We've done our pre-planning. We've got our tombstone up. And right on our tombstone, in, in big letters, the full reference, not just the address, but the full scripture, we've put this, and I've chosen to put it up in the NIV. And, and it's because it's it seems to be a bit clearer there. It says, for God made him who had no sin, meaning Jesus. God took Jesus who had no sin, and he made him to become sin for us. Now, I know I had a discussion uh, many years ago with a theologian friend of mine who says, no, no, Jesus didn't actually become sin. He just bore our sins. He never became sin. He just bore the guilt and shame of our sin. Okay, well, we could try to hammer that out, but I tell you one thing. It was bad enough that God had to turn his face from Jesus and, and not look to Jesus and that he would even cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so Jesus became our sin in God's eyes. That's really the point of the first half of this verse. And because Jesus bore our shame, our sin, our guilt, um, he was tortured with isolation. I like that that quote that we read earlier, isolation from him who is everywhere. That's, that's something I'll try to remember that one. And so Jesus was isolated from his father for the first and only time in all of eternity. And he paid the price for your sins. Now, that is what John 3.16 says. And, of course, John 3.16 does add one more thing, uh, that we would not perish but ever have everlasting life. But I think there's a missing element of John 3.16 that's brought out in Second Corinthians 5.21. 5, I hope you could track me on this. Not only did Jesus bear your sins and pay the price for your sins, but if you believe in him, if you trust Jesus as your Savior, then there is what I call the divine swap. The first part of the swap is he takes your sin, he takes your guilt, he takes your shame, he takes your punishment, and he, he he's now punished with the punishment that you deserve so that you won't have to be punished. And then the divine swap is then he takes, God takes his righteousness, Christ's righteousness, and puts it upon you that you might receive the reward and the blessing and the fellowship with God that you don't deserve. So did Jesus deserve your sin and guilt? No way. Was it fair? No, it wasn't fair. But I'm, I really am thankful. I praise God for that divine swap because he, God made him who knew no sin to become sin for me. And then on the other hand, uh, Jesus then, his righteousness is placed upon those who believe, those who trust in him. So God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So, folks, I, I, I know you've probably heard it many times if you listen to this station or if you go to my church because this is like a verse I harp on all the time. But, folks, you've got to understand this. The only way that you could be right before God is the divine swap. The only way that you or I could get to heaven is, that, is to accept that divine swap that Jesus offered at the cross, that he takes your sins and is treated the way your sin deserves to be treated. You trust in him and he gives you his righteousness and you are treated the way his righteousness deserves to be treated. It is not fair, 
but I praise God for it. It's not fair. If, if we did what was fair, we'd all go to hell. And so I love this. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's 2 Corinthians 5.21. And I always look for opportunities uh, to teach on that verse. And so we'll just keep moving on after that. Let's see, where are we at? <clears throat> at this moment, when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At this moment, the Father placed on him the sins of humanity to be paid as he was about to die. And uh, Isaiah 50, 59, 2 states that our sin separates us from God. By the way, you know, I'm looking at this, I'm reminded, I'm going to talk about all this on Easter Sunday. And if, you, if you're looking for a church to go to on Easter, if you don't already belong to a church, I know there's a lot of people out there who are just kind of like looky-loos, you're... Um, you're listening to the radio and you're not, right now not committed to a church. And unfortunately, that's because there's been a lot of people hurt in churches. I know you all have a story. Some people have been wounded and hurt, and so they're not ready to go back to church. Believe me, as a pastor and pastor's wife, Linda and I have been hurt by church a lot. <laughs> you know, Church is a dangerous place to be because there's lots of people there. And people aren't always considerate of your feelings, and people sometimes will stab you in the back. And people can be dangerous. They can hurt you, okay? And so, But the thing is, to me, it's, it's a, it's a no-brainer. It's always better to go to fellowship, to seek the Lord, to gather with the saints, to worship God. And and my greatest desire for you, my friend, if you're not plugged into a church, is that you find a good church. Find hopefully two things. Find a church that teaches the word and preaches accurately and worships God. And then also find a church near to you that you don't have to drive forever. Because once you find a church you're excited about, you want to start inviting your friends and relatives and coworkers to church. And it's hard to do that when... If it's just an internet church or if it's a church, you know, a hundred miles away, okay? So find a church. You know what? You could put a pin in the map where you live and draw a, a 10, 15 mile radius around it. And I'll bet you there's five good churches, good churches mm-hmm. within that radius. That's just the way it is. We've got a lot of good churches around here. Okay. So I'm, I'm distracting myself now. Where were we, where were we? Um, during his entire adult life, Jesus had an intimate, vibrant relationship with God as his Father. Suddenly, while suffering the agony and fatigue of crucifixion, Jesus could no longer feel that wonderful heavenly presence. At this moment, he could emphasize, excuse me, he could empathize, empathize with all of us when we feel separated from God because of the guilt of our sin. So, lot stated here, oh, I know what I was going to say. That where I distracted myself is that I'm going to clearly go through the gospel, um, the plan of salvation, and uh, if you're looking to bring a friend or relative to the Lord, we're going to make sure that the gospel is presented clearly. We're not going to just look at the resurrection, but I'll tell you, the the cornerstone of our faith is the resurrection, and this is the time to talk about it. Uh, but if you're looking for an opportunity to lead someone to Christ, uh, bring them to Calvary Chapel Eagle this Sunday, Easter Sunday. Um, but like I said, there's a lot of good churches around. So we're looking at here the... the um, Seven sayings of Christ on the cross, and we've already covered four of them. Let's now jump into the fifth one, and the theme of this is suffering. And Jesus, it says in John chapter 19, verse 28, Jesus, while he's hanging on the cross, uh, the fifth saying is, he said, I am thirsty. By the way, I'll remind you, if you're just joining us, that if you try to do a study on the seven sayings of Christ on the cross, you won't find them in any one gospel. You have to understand and, and look for them. Uh, and, and fortunately, we've got uh, great commentators and, and theologians and pastors who've put together these sayings and helped us you know, put it all together in chronological order that On the cross, Jesus had seven famous sayings, and each one is significant, but you won't find those seven all in one gospel. This one is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 28. And the time of the final sacrifice was close. Jesus had endured and overcome the heat, the pain, the rejection, the loneliness, and he he could have suffered in silence. And instead, unexpectedly, Instead of just suffering in silence and dying, knowing that everything had been completed so that the scripture would be fulfilled, he, he said, I 
thirst. I actually will look at that uh, as well um, Friday, that when he said this, this was also a part of a messianic prophecy. Now, on this particular um, saying, I thirst, I found a, a nice article by Warren Worsby. You guys have, have probably all per- familiar with uh, Pastor Warren Worsby. I love his commentators, excuse me, his commentaries. Uh, he um, he always has a, a real good way of putting things. So his insights on Jesus saying, I thirst. Let me just read this to you from the B series commentary. Um, Our Lord knew what was going on. He was fully in control as he obeyed the Father's will. He had refused to drink the pain-deadening wine that was always offered to those who were about to be crucified, and that's recorded in Matthew 27, 34. In, but in order to fulfill the scriptures in Psalm 69, 21, he said, I thirst. He was enduring real physical suffering, for he had a real human body. And he had just emerged from three hours of darkness when he felt the wrath of God and separation from God. When you combine the darkness, the thirst, the isolation, you have hell. <laughs> that's, a, that's insight, Warren. Um, there were physical reasons for this thirst. And he quotes Psalm 22, 15, which he, he talks about. It actually is a picture. Psalm 22, I've told you before, is a picture of Christ on the cross mm-hmm. where he says, my strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue clings to my jaws. And you've brought me to the dust of the earth. And, you know, that, that dusty, deadly scene on the cross, Jesus was dry and thirsty. And so we were all, excuse me, but we but there were also spiritual reasons. Okay, let's look at this. Psalm 42, verse 1 and 2. As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? That's a beautiful psalm. And uh, though that may not have directly referred to the crucifixion, it certainly fits. And so Warren ties that in. Warren Worsby, I'm quoting from. I'll continue to quote from Warren Worsby's B commentary. He says, <clears throat> earlier, he'd been offered that same drink, with, uh, which added gall, but he refused it, as recorded in Matthew 27, 34. Why refuse it earlier and now take a drink at the moment of death? Um, now, the, the word Bible commentary says this, that... Um, it makes this comment about the vinegar and mixed gall. The narcotic drink would have helped deaden the pain, but Jesus refused it. He drank the cup of suffering instead. Instead of reaching for a comforter, he was prepared to take the difficult but necessary path. When finally he had fully drank the cup of suffering, then he asked for a drink. So I want you to understand, there's two different drinks offered to Jesus on the cross. One was, and it was customary for those being crucified, that at least some sort of act of mercy they would offer. And how do you give somebody a drink who's on the cross? They would uh, dip a sponge in whatever liquid they wanted to offer, and they'd ho- hold it up, and the person could uh, grab a hold of the sponge with his mouth and suck on the sponge and get that liquid. But it was customary in that time to at least offer some kind of pain deadening medication and that was the first drink that was offered Jesus and he refused it because he knew he had come to bear the sins of the world to take the punishment to take the the full wrath of God and he did indeed take it without shying away from it but then when all was said and done when it was all finished uh, then he offered he asked for a drink and they gave him uh, another drink okay a different drink now there's two more sayings left. I'm looking at the time. We'll see how far we get with this. But uh, the the next saying of Jesus on the cross, and it's funny because as I'm as I was going over this uh, for Good Friday service, listening to Gary Crossland's uh, Merged Gospels audio, I realized after he said it is finished, uh, a lot of people think he said it is finished, and that was it. He died. Well, he said one more thing before he died. Okay, so let's just look at this. He says, it is finished, and that is found in John chapter 19, verse 30. Let me pull that up in case we want to look at it in its context. But this sixth saying of Christ on the cross was actually a, a, um, it's a cry of triumph. 
it actually, uh, many of you know, well, I think I'm already going to read it in one of the commentaries. It's tetelestai. It's a, it's a, 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 the, a the Greek saying uh, paid in full. I think we might even talk, I feel like I've said this already uh, in another day on this show about this. But when Jesus was on the cross and he said, it is finished, it's actually, you could take those same Greek words, to tetelestai, and you could translate it depending on what context you're using it. Uh, if you're using it as a um, financial transaction, you could translate it paid in full. And so Jesus on the cross, dying for our sins, when all of it was said and done, after the, the hours of darkness and all of the pain and all that is said was, was done and it was the price was paid, then he said, paid in full, or as our English Bibles translated, it is finished. Now, let me read from a few different commentaries that I think are real helpful, or I'd say study Bibles. The New Living Translation Study Bible says this, Then Jesus shouted out again, and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split apart, and the tombs were open. Here, there's so much we're missing here. If we're just looking at the seven sayings of Christ on the cross, I mean, it's wonderful, rich, deep. There's a lot of good things, but I don't want to miss this. That's why I included uh, the New Living Translation uh, study Bible notes, because it doesn't let us forget that when Jesus said it is finished, there was a great earthquake. The, the Roman centurion watching this is going, this was not an ordinary man. <laughs> this guy, this surely he was a righteous man. Surely this was the son of God. And, and then something amazing happened that in the temple, be, the, there was a veil, an 18-inch thick veil between the holy place and the most holy place in the Jewish temple. And that veil, during that earthquake, when Christ cried out, it is finished, that veil was torn from top to bottom, meaning that God tore it, okay? If it torn from bottom to top, that, that means that something earthly tore it up, from bottom up. But it was torn from top down. And I'm, I'm glad that it was clarified that when you read it in the scriptures, because that means that when Jesus said, it is finished, God himself reached down and grabbed that curtain and tore that temple veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. Once and for all, he's saying there is now no more separation between God and man because of what Christ did. The price is paid. The, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world died for our sins. The payment is made, paid in full. It is finished. Let's tear that veil. No more veil of separation between you and God. Folks, Jesus did it all. I love that. Okay, so I had to read that New Living Translation part because it, it added that. Now, the Fire Study Bible says some things about it is finished. This phrase is one one word in the Greek, and that's what I was telling you earlier. Teltelestai is the word. It, it, it was not a cry of termination, but a shout of triumph, declaring the completion of Christ's work on the cross. This, triumph declar this triumphant declaration was a signal that Jesus had, and it gives a list of things. Okay, let me just read them to you. What did Jesus do on the cross? Number one, he fulfilled his earthly mission given by the Father. Number two, he fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy about the Messiah's suffering. And you could read about that in Genesis 3.15, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22. Number three, he completed the work of spiritual rescue and restoration by providing the perfect sacrifice for sins. And there's a whole list of cross-references here. Number four, what did Jesus do on the cross? He secured the decisive victory over Satan and his network of demons, uh, Colossians 2.15. And number five, he achieved the means of restoring God's relationship with his creation and sinful humanity, list of cross-references here. Nothing can can be or needs to be added to Christ's finished work on the cross. Wait, there's more to read, but I want to tell you something. If Jesus said, it is finished, then don't you think, I've got mm -hmm. to pay the rest. If Jesus cried out, paid in full, then don't be deceived into thinking, yes, Jesus gave a down payment for my sins, but I've got to make up for the rest of the, the cost. That's what the cults will teach you. <clears throat> the cults 
Uh, that, that's one of the distinctions of false doctrine or the false religion of a cult. They will tell you that Jesus just died on the cross to get things going or to pay the down payment, and you've got to keep paying with all your righteousness and all your good works and all of your, your sinless life or whatever, they jump it through the hoops of obeying the laws and ordinances of the church, and they'll add to it and say, it wasn't all paid for at the cross. You've got to pay for the rest of it. He just gave a down payment. There are prominent cults today that actually teach that. That's how you recognize if it's a cult, folks, because I like this line here in the Fire Study Bible. Nothing can be or needs to be added to Christ's finished work on the cross. Folks, if you believe that Jesus dying on the cross for your sins isn't enough, then you're cheapening the work of the cross. Then you're accusing God of not doing everything he said that he did. You're accusing Jesus of not being enough. He was enough, folks. So let me read that one more time and I'll keep reading. Nothing can or needs to be added to Christ's finished work on the cross and the results are are ongoing because he endured the punishment for our offenses and rebellion against God he opened the way for people to have a relationship with him more cross references on that all who accept Christ's sacrifice for them and yield their lives to him receive God's gifts of forgiveness and eternal life I like that folks because that's one of the reasons I like this particular study Bible tells it the way it is that what does it take to have forgiveness of sins and eternal life, accept Christ's sacrifice and yield your life to him. Now, some of you out there might even on the other end of the spectrum might be saying, no, you don't have to do anything. You just, he did it for you and you're saved. Wait, I do believe that part of the gospel call is believe and repent. Repentance and faith are the two calls to come to Christ. Repentance and faith. So, you know, you the pendulum could swing too far one way or the other. Some people say, you've got to do it all. You, He just paid the down payment. You've got to pay the rest. Others would say, he did it all, and you don't even have to do anything, as if um, repentance isn't even a part of the deal. Okay? No. He calls you to faith and repentance. So I like that. Let me read that last line again. All who accept Christ's sacrifice for themselves and yield their lives to him receive God's gifts of forgiveness and eternal life. Now, let me keep reading. I believe this is still part of the Fire Study Bible commentary notes. Uh, Considering all of God's wonderful and creative acts, it may seem um, somewhat ironic that his highest purpose to bring eternal life came through death. Well, there's an interesting thought. The creator, John chapter 1, was sacrificed for his creation. Another deep thought. Through this horrific event, Jesus' mission was accomplished. The man, the God-man, had paid the perfect price for sin and bridged the gap between a holy God and sinful people. Through faith in Christ, we now have full access to God. Matthew twenty-seven fifty-one. If we surrender our lives to the one who went to this extreme for us, we can experience the life he intends for us. Um, And folks, it's good stuff. I I recommend, again, uh, reading from the uh, Fire Study Bible Notes, I recommend if you're looking to add another great study Bible to your uh, collection, the Fire Study Bible is a good one. Now, we have time maybe to just read the, the last saying, and we'll see how far we get on this. The last saying of Christ on the cross before he died is found in Luke chapter 23, verse 46. And it's, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. See, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. He looked forward to finally being reunited with his Father. And at that dramatic moment, Jesus died for you and me because the true Passover sacrifice for each and every one of us was Jesus Christ. Now, um, I know I won't be able to read uh, all the little commentaries and notes that I have here. We might wrap it up tomorrow. But the Holman Christian Standard Study Bible, there's another good one, says this uh, about his, um, his last saying. While expressing faith in God by reciting Psalm 31.5. Oh, by the way, that is Psalm, Psalm 31.5. says, into your hands I commit my spirit. And so <clears throat> Jesus was actually quoting a psalm. Okay, Jesus breathed his last. 
Jesus was placed on the cross at about 9 a.m., and he died after only six hours. An unusually short time, crucifixion victims sometimes lingered for two or three days before death occurred. Uh, and I don't know, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of grateful that it, it wasn't one of those uh, grueling things for Jesus, though it was torment. And again, I'll remind you, the greatest torment Jesus went through was not the cross itself, but it was bearing the sins of the world, okay? Uh, again, the Fire Study Bible says this about Father into your hands, I commit my spirit. Jesus voluntarily gave his life for us, yielding every moment of his life, even unto death, to God's plan and purpose. At that moment, he returned in spirit to his Father in heaven. Um, good stuff, good stuff. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Uh, there were Jesus. These were Jesus' last words before his death. Faithful followers of Christ have often used them in their dying moments. They express dependence on God and faith in good, his goodness to the very end. Committing ourselves into God's care is appropriate during any time of danger and difficulty. Uh, Warren Worsby says this, this was actually a bedtime prayer used by Jewish children, and it tells us how our Lord died confidently uh, confidently and willing. And uh, John 10, verse 17 and 18, uh, victoriously, those who know Jesus as their Savior may die with the same confidence and assurance. Good stuff. I, uh, so we were able to get through all seven sayings. Tomorrow we do have... Um, uh, some other things we could talk about. What is it, Thursday? So on Good Friday, tomorrow, we'll talk about a couple other things about uh, the cross. We'll look at uh, the cross in a, in a nutshell, okay? So join us tomorrow, and Good Friday, we will look at one more look at the cross before Easter. Lord bless you guys, and we thank you for listening.